We are from Wanya Heights Primary School, which is in Tasmania. Our project is about a heat sensor for cars that prevent kids from dying inside cars because of overheating. Archie thought of this idea because it's a major problem and it's also the thing Archie's mom tells him so he gets out of the car. When cars overheat, it can cause children to suffer life-threatening heat stroke, rapid dehydration, suffocation and death. It, heat stroke is the leading cause of non-crash vehicle related deaths in children under 15. Heat stroke can happen even when cars are parked in the sh shade. Heat stroke can happen when the body cannot cool itself quickly enough. A child's body heats three to five times faster than an adult's does. The great the younger the child, the greater the sensitivity of the heat stroke. A child can die when the temperature of the car reaches 42 degrees Celsius. After learning about this major issue, we decided to develop a heat sensor for cars to solve this problem. We used microbits for our invention because we can download code on it, so it works well for, for the sensor we designed. Our heat sensor does not have any complicated technique to use it. It consists of two separate microbits covered in black boxes. The design is simple. There is a small window in each box that lets the user see the temperature and there is a built-in speaker on the box that the user carries in. We used microbit coding to set the temperature on each of the microbits. The microbit in the car picks up the temperature and send, sends it to the other microbit using Bluetooth. Once the, once the temperature goes over 35 degrees, an alarm will go off. Another alarm will go off when the temperature reach, reaches full 40 degrees Celsius, which and it is more intense to alert the user that is cars about to reach the temperature, which can cause even death. We also researched modern car companies to find out if any of them had a heat sensor, but they didn't. So far, we could find nothing. So with the right execution, our prototype of the heat sensor can be a very useful device for families with little children in them. We believe, over time, our invention can be improved and can be developed into a mobile app for phones and cars for effective and hassle-free use. The advantages of our invention are that it is, uses simple technology, it is easily stored, it uses Bluetooth, it is cheap, and it is an original idea which no one else has ever done in Nifty. We think our invention is good because it has originality, we have evidence, and we have done a lot of research. Working on this project, we have learned a lot about technology, microbits, Bluetooth, and coding. We also learned a lot about working as a part of the team and how we can contribute to work with our skills. This knowledge will surely help us in the future. Now we will show you our car model and a, a micro bit code. This is our model. Inside we have displayed um, that the micro, we have um, where we suggest to put the micro bit is right there. As you can see, we marked it heat sensor. And now we can show you the code. Oh, we didn't have the code. Oh, it's, it's on the, it's on the, oh, share screen. This is the code. Um, this is the 35 degree Alarm. Just move that out. We just did that. Um, this is the radio number. Our micro bits are kind of like walkie talkies with a channel that nobody can find. And this is our 40 degree alarm. Any questions? The poster, the poster. Oh, the poster. And this is our poster. This is how the micro bits like look from the inside and with the boxes. Good morning, judges and special guests. Welcome to our presentation. Our project name is called Healthy Body, Healthy Mind. This app was designed to help people be healthier physically and mentally. Our project has never been created before, making it unique. 
We have two sides of our project, the website and the app. App is very comfortable because you can go onto it whenever you want at any time. The website side of the project is packed with yoga and mindfulness videos. Now we'll go over to Venu to explain the app in more detail. Oh, okay, join broker. So this is our Scratch project, and we're, we're going to start off by typing in our name. And mine is Vinu, so I'll click enter, and it says, hello, Vinu. So we have two sections in our project, the mindfulness and the talk to person. I'm going to go okay. to the talk to person first. So there's four sections here, and they'll ask you how you're feeling today. I'm just going to say I'm feeling mad, and it's going to ask you why. Maybe it's because I feel something's unfair. And here's an explanation that should make me feel better. The second part of this app is the mindfulness section. And here we have the yoga section, the breathing section, and the sleep section. Now I'm gonna show you how the magnificent red button works. Say you're sleepy because you haven't slept enough. Well, it's recommending me to go to the sleep section. So I'll just click the, this red Where button. Where are you going, Daniel? I'll type in sleep. And boom, I'm on the sleep page. The last way to control this app is using the, the micro bit, which is explained in detail in our feedback channel, which is popping up right now. The feedback, we've used the feedback channel uh, as an advantage because we, we can explain um, some updates and we can explain how the micro bit works. You've all, already been um, receiving some messages from people um, and they're giving feedback already. Wait a minute, it looks like Spice Man's found a, pro a problem in our project. He says the arrow is facing the wrong way in the begin talk section. So I'm going to go see inside. I'm going to, and I'm now going to go down to the bottom and click this arrow. And I'll just fix the coding here. And boom, the arrow is facing the right way now. So that's how this Scratch project works in detail. Now I'm going to... Now, now Carolyn's going to show you how the website works in more detail. Uh, thank you, Vinu. Hello, my name is Caroline, and I'm going to present the website portion of this project. Our website has been created through the app Weebly, and there are five main pages. The home page, the meditation page, the yoga page, sketch page, and feedback page. Each page has different information centered around its name. The home page has information about why being healthy is important and has information about it. Now the meditation page has information about meditation and its benefits and has two meditation videos. Next onto our yoga page. Our yoga page has information about yoga and has a yoga video for you to indulge in. Next is our scratch page and it has in, in a paragraph about the scratch page and has a link to the scratch. Next is our feedback page. Our feedback page has information, uh, has a Google form, so you can give feedback if you found something wrong or you want to give something to work on. But that's all on the website for now. On to you, Xavier. Thank you, Carolyn. That is a wrap of our, of our project. We have worked extremely hard on this. The Healthy Body, Healthy Mind team are here to solve world problems and have fun. I hope you've enjoyed listening to our presentation. Thank you. Business Beamer, it's a toilet cleaner. So when you were to tilt it down, it lights up, as you can see. Now, I have this little PowerPoint that I'm going to read from here. How it, how it works is it attached... It attaches to the toilet lid exactly in the middle, so smack bang in the middle. LED lights are UVC lights as an AT tiny resistor, a tilt sensor, and it's battery powered, so you'll have to change the batteries. 
Background information, there are three types of UV light. My project has proven the germicidal properties of UVC light. UVC has a short wavelength. It deactivates the DNA of germs, stopping it from reproducing. Now, am I allowed to share a screen with you? Yep. Oh, I, I don't know how to share, uh, share screen. Yeah, share screen. Okay. So I'm gonna share this PowerPoint. Now, this was also in my movie. So you, this, this is the code. This is all the code. So this would also show you what's theoretically going on. And here's the real life version. As you can see, it, it works really well. And this, this, depending on the size, can be used in different circumstances. So in, ho so in hotels where the cleaner got the mutated version of coronavirus, the cleaner could have like a badge that scans on the card reader and it turns on the UVC light. And as a safety measure, if, if you put your hand to the door, like to the card area, it'll turn it off, letting the cleaner know that somebody's still inside. Pool beamer, where it'll take a little bit of water and start cleaning it out and then waste water beamer. It's essentially the same as pool beamer, but um, instead it has a filter. So it would do this. And now I'm gonna stop sharing. Also, some of the challenges I had during this device is we left it for like, uh, I don't know, a long time and the batteries ran out and something fell out of this. So we had to go get replacements. Other challenges is the metal started corroding when we tried it out, the water, there was water vapor and it started corroding the metal. So this would be aluminium or something like that. So that it won't corrode, even, in, even if you're in the saltiest of environments. Also, um, if this was attached to the toilet, it'd be really uncomfortable. So we would design something that would let this click in to the toilet seat and then when you press it, it would click out. And to make sure that it doesn't hurt anybody, there's an on and off switch. So if you're sitting on the toilet and it suddenly turns on, it does, and then you turn it off so that it can't hurt you or hurt anything on you. Because um, this light can actually hurt your eyesight. But when the toilet seat's tilted down, it works like it's meant to. By um, showing, when it shines off, the germicidal properties make it so that the bacteria can't reproduce inside the toilet. So this would bring way to stuff like E. coli and stuff like that. And this could fit in every single type of toilet. Toilets in the Middle East, toilets in Africa, where they're just like a hole in the ground where you could have like this little ring of UV light cleaning out everything. This could also be used to um, clean out food without using pesticides. This is one of the most versatile devices in the entire world. As you can see, this is the AT Tiny with all the code that I showed you in the PowerPoint. The UV lights are also capable of shining. So it, how far away is it depends on how much time it takes to clean itself. So if, if you're shining on a surface five meters away, it, depending on the strength of the light, it can take 30 minutes. If you're shining one, minute, um, one meter, it could be five minutes, depending on the strength of the light which makes it so versatile. I believe that if we were to put this on every single toilet by 2025, then um, most of diseases like E. coli or heart diseases or really, really, really bad stuff will not be a worry anymore.
And, and if this is already in subject in hospitals, for beds with COVID-19, we have, we put UVC light right next to them when they're not being used, which cleans off COVID-19, letting them be used by other people. I got inspired by this device when my teacher told me about the um, UVC light on the hospital beds. And then I thought I could, I could change the world. Today I'm here with the DCCD, the Don't Catch COVID device. So the problem I'm trying to solve is that people can't accurately keep 1.5 meters from each other. So this device can measure that and light up and beep when you're too close. So my original idea was for bicycles and cars to make sure that the bicycle and the car stay 1.5 meters or one meter from, from each other. But when COVID hit, I adapted that for people. So I used microbits who, and I'm using the radio signal strength to measure how far away, because when the signal strength is stronger, you're closer, and when it's weaker, you're further away. So in the original design, I didn't have a buzzer, and I had more integers for the lights and distances, but it was not very accurate. And I had the transmit power set very high and that also messed up the accuracy. So this is my code. So I have a function, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. So at the beginning, it sets the radio grid to 55, which is just a random number that I have chosen. And then it'll set the transfer power to one because when the transfer power is lower, it will, be more accurate over shorter distances. So the default transit power is seven, which is the highest. So forever, it will send number 99, which is just another random number, and then it will wait two seconds for it to complete the function, and then it will send the number again, and then wait two seconds, and then again. So I found my main function. So when it receives the, the packet or the number, it will, if the, and if the single strength is less than minus 90, I've got a comment here to say that it will do nothing. Now, if the signal strength is less than minus 60, it will show the one leg in the middle, and then it'll turn the pin on, which is the buzzer, and then it will pause for half a second, Turn the pin off. So that's very short B because you're not very close. And then if it's not minus 90 and if it's not minus 60, then you're too close. So it'll light up with full LEDs and then the buzzer will last for one and three quarters of a second and then turn off. Now it always clears after so that the transmissions don't get mixed up. So the, change, the, the main changes were the, the transfer power and the integers as well as the buzzer addition because when you're in a workplace you don't constantly check your watch you always just only check it if it's beeping or vibrating so and now we'll demonstrate it for you so i'll plug in the power so these distances have been changed for demonstration purposes so I can show it to you more accurately. So it's way too close. But if I step back over here, and it takes two seconds and then it'll go back. So I'm not too far away. Now in real life, it would be the distances would be slightly different because when you're within 1.5 meters, it'll be full, and when you're out of 1.5 meters, it will be one. So when you're in range, it's one. When you're too close, it's four. And if you're not in range, it'll just be zero. Here we took close here. And if I go over here, not too far away, but of course these have been um, altered for demonstration. So 
So the only kill switch is pulling out the power because it's supposed to be annoying. So now these are the posters over here. So this poster, this one's kind of a little bit of a joke because proper social distancing means two bush turkeys, three bilbies, or 10 Richmond Birmingham butterflies. That's 1.5 meters. Now over here, I really liked this one because I like this image because COVID is like a flame and the people are like matches. So if all the matches are all lined up, COVID will keep spreading. So you have to remove one match or you have to stay 1.5 meters so that the flame can't keep spreading. We designed this watch to save lives from any age and to take care of people who are in need and to help disabled people. Libby will talk more about this and why we designed it and in like way later in the presentation. The life saving watch is designed to save thousands of lives every year. We know that lots of people get stuck in rips and sometimes lifeguards are not there to save them. So we have put all our ideas together to find a way to help. We have built on this project for over 12 months and this is the result. This watch is not only for the beach, but it can be used for little kids playing in the park, public pools, schools, excursions, COVID-19 quarantine facilities, nursing homes and many other places. We have modified the power on the life-saving watch so that we can present this using shorter distances for this presentation. As you can see, this watch is made from silicone rubber for the watch band, an on and off switch, a micro bit, and a case made from blue silicone filament off the 3D printer. We think that this watch is a really good design and we hope that you do too. We also designed this little instruction guide which will help tell you more about the life saving. So if you are new and you just bought one, then you can flip through all these pages and it will tell you stuff about the life saving watch. Now Jade is going to show you one of the functions with the help of Ari. Over to you, Jade. Ari, can you please go stand up? Think of the watch turns on, it will automatically it will automatically show a straight face. You will then need to press button A to get it up and running. As soon as you get it, the watch up and running, it will show you how many meters away you are from the other person. As the distance between the two watches increase, the receiver will say certain words, such as look, find and help. So if Ari walked far away, it will also tell us if we were to have to find her or if she's okay, we just need to look. Now it is telling us to look. So now that means we have to go and look to find Ari. It's a look out for Ari. Over to you, Ari. And now Chloe will go, go down to the door. By pressing button B, it sends an alert with an X to the receiver. This tells the receiver that you need some assistance and someone to watch and to see where you are. So now it's saying alert, so it means that we need to we need to get someone alerted to help Chloe. Now Scarlett's going to go to the door with the watch and we're going to demonstrate another function. Finally, there is the I'm OK function by pressing button A and button B at the exact same time. By pressing button A and B at the same time, it will send a love heart to the receiver. These two buttons mean that you are OK and that you don't need any assistance. If the transmitter runs it flat or stops working, the receiver will see that something has gone wrong and send an error message. The user of the watch can then locate the other person to replace the battery or fix any issues that may have happened. This watch is amazing for park play, public pools, excursions, school, people with disabilities and COVID quarantine and much more places. My team and I are extremely excited to see this go into a production. In 2020, my brother was 
in a surfing accident and he was on his way surfing back to the shore and his board came up and knocked him in the head. He then got concussed and went under the water and he said he thought he had drowned. He had broken his nose, chipped a bone in his neck and he also cut his lips with his teeth. Luckily, he's safe, but a woman found him. But if he was wearing a life-saving watch, then his mates could have been notified that he needed help. Now he's safe and sound at home, sitting on the couch and watching TV. Thank you. Thank you. We now have a special surprise for you. <laughs> Guess what? Men life saving watch! And it can keep people in touch! And plus, it's a watch! Eight million tonnes of plastic trash enters the sea from land every year. That means throwing almost five plastic bags filled with rubbish into every metre of coastline in the world. Across our ocean, trash flows in a circulation, being dispersed almost everywhere. It breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, gets digested by animals across the marine world and sinks to the bottom of the sea. Anyone can make plastic anywhere in the world and they can sell it anywhere else in the world. In order to solve the problem of marine waste, we need to completely rethink how we are doing things. Currently we take, make and dispose of the plastic but in order to create a sustainable future for coming generations we need to make it so that rubbish can be effectively and conveniently recovered, reused and fed back as a valuable plastic. The overall goal is to create an economy where plastic never becomes waste. To do that, everyone needs to be taking their part. People need to sort their rubbish into the correct categories, otherwise it will all get dumped into landfill and end up in the ocean. I know from personal experience, how frustrating it can be to sort rubbish. However, my project aims to permanently resolve this issue. Hi, my name is Charles Tang. I'm 10 years old and I'm in year five at East Martin Primary School. And this is my project, Intelligent Bin. Intelligent Bin is a smart bin that utilises artificial intelligence and machine learning. It detects, recognises and classifies different types of rubbish. Not only is waste segregation not a very pleasant job to do and is very time consuming, but it is also quite expensive. Intelligent Bin uses relatively affordable parts and requires little skill to operate. Big factories could have multiple sorters running at once to save time. And as the robot is a one-off purchase in the long term, Intelligent Bin will be much cheaper than hiring people to sort rubbish industrially. Furthermore, because a robot is sorting the trash, it means that humans are protected from fumes such as greenhouse gases, including methane and carbon dioxide. Intelligent Bin runs on a web page that is connected to an Arduino board through a USB data cable. It connects to the web page on my computer to run a live stream of what the camera sees. 
I trained my project to recognise if it detects landfill waste, mixed recycling or if there's nothing there, and then sends a signal of either 0 or 1 to the Arduino. The Arduino will then perform a different action for the signal that it receives. In this case, it will either tip the rubbish into a landfill or tip the rubbish into mixed recycling. If there is nothing there, the AI won't send a signal and the Arduino won't do anything until it detects something. During the creation of my project, I used multiple components of hardware. To transmit and receive serial messages, I used an Arduino Leonardo. This was connected to a servo motor that would tip the rubbish into the correct section. On the software side of things, I used several different coding languages and applications. I trained the AI on Google Collab using the TensorFlow Object Detection API. Google Collab is one of the only free GPUs available and is coded on a Jupyter Notebook style notebook using Python. It was important for me to use a GPU as to train the AI on the CPU on my computer, it would have taken over a week. Originally, I had ordered the Google Coral USB Accelerator, a TPU made professionally for training AI models. But unfortunately, my order got cancelled because of coronavirus. I didn't have a GPU that I could use, so the next best option was Google Collab. I also used p5.js, an online JavaScript library that I used to create the web page, including gaining webcam access and talking to the Arduino. I used the Arduino IDE along with the web USB library to tell the Leonardo board what it should do when it receives different messages. I think that the hardest part for me when, my, when building my project was collecting the images for the data set containing the images that I wanted to train my, my AI with. In order to create an accurate model, I had to individually take a few hundred photos of everything that I wanted to classify before labelling every single image. I've done the majority of my work outside of school, mostly at my stem cell club and at home. Intelligent Bin is an improvement from my previous project last year. Before my project ran on a pre-trained model, meaning that it wasn't as accurate and it required another person to be nearby to monitor it. My newest version of Intelligent Bin is faster, more precise and more convenient. The inspiration for my project came at the start of last year when I went on a school excursion to a waste depot in Wingfield. While there, I learnt just how devastating a problem pollution is and how important waste management is. I was shocked by the rapidly increasing rate of climate change and litter in the ocean and decided to try and do something to fix it. Hello, I'm Quinlan. And I'm Cameron. And we are the Vexi School team from Warunga Public School. We want to start by saying thank you to the judges for selecting our project to represent New South Wales in the national finals. In this submission, we will start by replaying our first video. Then, we'll talk about some of the things we've done since then, including how we've responded to the feedback from the state judges. Let's watch the first video. Hello, I'm Quinlan. And I'm Cameron. We are from Vaxi Cool from, uh, from Rwanga Public School and for our project we made a device to help transport vaccines and other medicines anywhere. The problem we're trying to fix is that it can be hard to get important medicines like vaccines to third world countries. Some vaccines and medicines like insulin need to be kept cool, but not too cold, between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. 
Other things might need to be kept warm when delivering to cold climates. It's, it's fine if you have a special delivery vehicle to transport the medicines, but that might not be possible in some remote places such as those that can only be reached by foot. So special delivery vehicles also cost more money and can be difficult to arrange, uh, which, uh, which might be a problem if you need to get medicine somewhere fast. The way we aim to fix this is with Vaxicle, a temp portable temperature control system. Let's turn it on. So what are these two switches doing? Uh, so, uh, so one switch is for the fan and pump and then the other one's for the cooler. So what are these batteries powering? Those are two 12 volt batteries powering the fan and pump and the cooler. So what is this Arduino doing? Uh, so, uh, so that Arduino is powering the relay, uh, which is powering the cooler. So what does this cooler do and how does it do it? That is a twin Peltier cooler, um, uh, which, uh, which when you run power through one way, it cools and then, uh, and then when you run it through the other way, it heats. So how does it tell what the temperature is? Oh, uh, with this temperature, digital temperature sensor. Where is the temperature sensor? Underneath this cooling cup. So I guess I make sure it reads the temperature from the sensor under the can and then it activates the cooler if the temperature is too high. Yes. And then it does that with the piece of code we wrote. Yep. Okay, let's have a look at our code now. First, we import the libraries needed for the temperature sensor. Then we needed to set the pins that the sensor and the relay will use. This is where the, where the actual program starts. We are using the serial mon monitor so we can get the temperature inf information out. This allows us to record the temperature which is needed to ensure the vaccines are still good and we can use the time to match with the GPS information. We set the wanted temperature which, which turns the cooler on if the temperature is too high. And the temperature when we turn the cooler off if it is too low. Here it reads in the temperature and if it is too high, we set the pin status to high uh, to turn the relay on. If the temperature is below the off point, we we set the pin status to low, uh, uh, which turn the relay off. We then upload this to the Arduino. Um, we came up with this because of coronavirus, and in the future we may be looking to transporting vaccines for it. And also we got sick and tired of having warm drinks. <laughs> uh, so the main problem that we faced uh, 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 was that the temperature readers uh, 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 weren't reading correctly um, so we um, installed some new software and then it started to work. Was there anything else? Oh uh, yes, and the and the Peltiers were overheating, so we bought the voltage regulator. We would like to make the device smaller and more compact and maybe look at how it can be made more energy efficient so it drains the battery more slowly. We we were even thinking about seeing if it could be solar powered although that might not be possible. We also wanted to be able to connect the device to the internet so that we could send the temperature and GPS location to us every few seconds. 
with that we could view where the vexicle is and uh, see the temperature goes too high or too low. With some help from our parents, we create a sample dashboard um, that shows some simulated data using a product called Spotfire from TipCal. On the right are the different trips that were logged. If I click on the trip during the public school, I can see the journey that was made from the Hornsby Hospital to our school. On September the 1st, the dots are all blue, so that temperature didn't go over the set limit, which in this case is 8 degrees. If we click on the trip to the Taramara Nursing Home, we can see the same thing. The dots are all blue, and the temperature graph at the bottom doesn't go over 8 degrees. But if we click on the trip to Taramara Public School, we can see some red dots from about 10.48 a.m. This means that the temperature has gone over 8 degrees and the vaccines or medicine might not be safe to use. We can even select the dots in the chart and it highlights them on the map. We can zoom in on the map to see what the vaccine was at the time. It looks like there might have been a breakdown or something, some sort of delay or accident near the school that caused the delay and maybe that's why the temperature went too high. Finally, we'd love to see if we could build this device to a drone so that we could make medicine deliveries where there are no roads. You can see two examples of that here, where a drone is being used to deliver medicine to some nursing homes in Taramara and at Hornsby. Oh, well, we think that this project could really help people. Thank you for reviewing our project. Since our first submission, we have made some improvements in Batsy Cool version 2. First, we added some insulation around the cooling tubes to cut down on the amount of energy needed to heat or cool the vaccines. We also made some changes to the code. Instead of waiting for the temperature to hit the limit, we now check to see if it was ramping up or down. So we can adjust the output of the Peltier cooler slash heater when the temperature starts to rise or fall, rather than waiting for it to hit the limit. Together, these changes help save energy while still keeping the temperature right. Of course, Vaxie Cool version 2 is still quite big, and so it would need to be carried in a car or van. Don't forget that the original Vaxie Cool was created before we knew much about COVID-19 vaccines. Since then, we found out that some COVID-19 vaccines can be stored at standard fridge temperatures. However, as the New South Wales judges noted, the Pfizer vaccine needs a deep freeze at negative 70 degrees centigrade. For this, we will need to use dry ice rather than water cooling. So we create a new type of Vaxicool. Introducing the Vaxi Supercool. Vaxi Supercool has just one sensor to track the vaccine temperature. It sits here next to the vaccine container. Around the container, we can put the dry ice. We're using the same sensor from version one, which can handle temperatures as low as negative 80. Since we don't have the water pump, and the Peltier heater slash cooler, we don't need as much power. So we only need one six volt battery. We are also going to use a Raspberry Pi instead of an Arduino, since it's smaller and lighter and has Wi-Fi connection to transfer data. This means that Vaxi Supercool is light enough to be put on drone. So that's exactly what we did. Vaxi Supercool can deliver a vaccine to remote locations while still making sure that the vaccine stays cold enough the whole time. In the future, we'd like to connect it to the internet so you can track it in real time. And maybe send an SMS alert if the temperature gets too warm. 
So that's our update submission for the National Young ICT Explorers Competition. Thank you for your time. I'm Xianwei Chen. This is my smart home that I made using Raspberry Pi and Little Bits. During the past two months, I optimized smart home. The system architecture, hardware and software design is still the same. I just had two small changes. I replaced Little Bits with a circuit and I also changed some of the product brands. I used many technologies such as Raspberry Pi to control the smart home, Python as a software and Django for remote control. I also used the temperature sensor and light sensor. I used the RFID board, OLED, LED light and fan. I have two circuits, one for the light and one for the pet feeder. Hi, my name is Bob and I'm a Lego EV3 robot. Hi Bob, do you know how many parts there are to this smart home? I can control the lighting appliance, temperature appliance, access control and remote feeding. You can use a computer to control Raspberry Pi remotely. The following describe the hardware and software designs. This is a hardware connection diagram. As you can see, Raspberry Pi can periodically check the data from RFID board, temperature sensor and light sensor. It will then drive the relative motors. For example, open or close the door turn on or off the light, fan and heater. Raspberry Pi periodically shows the sensor's data on the display screen. It can also open and drive the feeder. The software design consists of two main parts. The first part can read the temperature, humidity, date and time. It shows the information on the display screen before sleeping for 5 seconds and repeating the cycle. The second main part reads the data from the sensors of access control, light application, temperature application and pet feeder. It drives the relative motors and sleeps for 3 seconds. This is the access control application. The RFID board is connected to Raspberry Pi, which can open and close the door. When the light is red, it means that the door is locked. And when the light is green, it means that the door is unlocked. This is an automatic light sensor. When it is light, the automatic light will turn off. And when it is dark, the automatic light will turn on. Yes, it's very cool. This is a temperature sensor and this is a heater and fan. The temperature sensor can detect the temperature and humidity. Raspberry Pi can control the heater and fan to keep the room temperature in a comfortable range. By using a heat pack, we can gradually rise the temperature. The fan has turned on. By using an ice pack, we can also lower the temperature. This ice pack is huge. The fan has turned off. The heater has turned on. When you're on vacation or travelling on holiday, your pets can be kept safe, happy and healthy by the pet feeder. You can remotely control it from anywhere in the world and you can also set the times it feeds. Display board can display the time, 
day, temperature and humidity in real time. In the future, AI will definitely be a part of our lives. I can't wait to see what they can do.